Hello everyone, this is uh, Bob Browner with Community Coronavirus Update number 70. Uh, themes today is uh, will we pee on the electric fence again, uh, plus some CD school, CDC school safety studies and the importance of testing. And so this is one of my favorite Will Rogers quotes uh, that we can uh, have, we can learn from learned men, uh, like people like uh, our local experts, uh, Ali Khan and James Lawler or, or, Nat, or Larry Brilliant, who I'll talk about in a minute. Uh, or we can at least watch people make mistakes down the road and not do what they did, or we can go ahead and pee on the electric fence again ourselves, and it looks like we're going to do it ourselves yet again uh, for, the, I guess, the third or fourth time now. Um, so the, the thing is, people keep forgetting it's vaccinations and non-pharmaceutical inventions. One alone will not get us there. Uh, we need to do both. Um, so people have forgotten about the importance of masking and, of course, the importance of test, trace, and isolate. We've almost completely forgotten about that. And that is what's causing us to maybe have, unfortunately, our vaccine effort may not be enough. And we may be at yet another surge uh, and a lot of uh, hitting hospital capacity yet again because uh, people have forgotten this. Uh, so there's an article in the Wall Street Journal written by Larry Brilliant, and I'll talk a little bit more about him in a minute. Uh, basically, uh, that herd immunity by vaccines alone aren't, aren't enough. You're going to have to do innovative contact tracing as well. Uh, unfortunately, the article is behind a paywall, so you have to have the Wall Street Journal subscription, but I think you get the point, hopefully. Uh, so what we're seeing is, unfortunately, the variants coming back. So here's Douglas and Sarpy County, uh, Omaha metro area. If you look down here, you'll see that their rates of spread have gone up about 50% in the past week. Uh, this could be the start of a surge just like uh, has happened, already happened in Europe and is already happening across the country. Uh, you may have seen the headlines in, uh, in Omaha that it was there was just ju just one uh, daycare outbreak had over 100 positive cases, and it is that UK variant we're so worried about. Uh, if you look at nationally, the B117 UK variant prevalence, uh, we, what we see is that uh, in state after state, the one that has a high prevalence is the, is the next red state. Uh, and so uh, we, I've talked previously in past weeks about New Jersey and Michigan, but now Minnesota is the less lightest to, to flip red. And so uh, we're, we had, had almost no red a few weeks ago. Now we're getting red, state after state turning red as that variant takes off. I think we're probably going to see a few more as the week goes on. Hopefully Nebraska is not next. Um, and, and, you know, essentially, you know, we've talked already, like I said, about Michigan. Their numbers are still headed up. Uh, now Minnesota is headed up. It uh, looks like Colorado, Florida might be next. Uh, and then, of course, uh, probably the Omaha metro area, it looks like. Uh, and what people are forgetting, there's too much uh, uh, emphasis being put on natural herd humidity. And what uh, Manaus, Brazil, uh, we've talked about this over and over again and again, is that about six to eight months later, uh, the old, old coronavirus uh, strains do not provide uh, immunity against the new variant strains. And so the people who were infected previously are now going through it again, and unfortunately, sometimes even worse. Uh, what I've been following locally and here in Lincoln is UNL's COVID dashboard. And unfortunately, on Monday, uh, if you do the math, 20 out of 1,079 is actually double what the percentage of last week was. Hopefully, that's just a one-day blip and not a th sign of things to come. But this is where I'd worry about it because uh, their uh, biggest surge in the, at the university campus was when kids came to school back in August, September, parties, things like that. This would be about the time their immunity might be waning if we were going to do a Manaus Brazil thing. So this is about when you'd expect this to happen. So hopefully they're sequencing some of these and we'll find out how many of these are the UK variant and how much we have to worry here locally. Uh, and this is our problem. Uh, and some people would say, oh, but so many people have been vaccinated. Yes, a lot of people have been vaccinated, but nowhere near enough. Uh, so even in the 65 plus age group here in Lincoln, Nebraska, and, and the health department's been doing a good job of putting this out here, about 20 to about 70 to 80 percent have been vaccinated, but that also means conversely 20 to 30 percent of the elderly have not been vaccinated. And it was infecting about 30 percent of those elderly last time that killed off thousands of Nebraskans. Plus, you have all these people who aren't even close to herd immunity ranges. Uh, they could also get infected, and this new variant is worse. So some of these people would also get hospitalized and also probably die. And, and of course, it's not just dying. People are forgetting about COVID long haulers, some of the heart defects, some of the permanent lung damage. So just not dying isn't the whole story. Uh, so we could be overloading hospitals again in another month or two if we don't tamp this down and react fast. Um, so the variant severity, as we talked about last week, is still being confirmed in studies. The infectiousness seems to be about 50 to 70 percent more infectious, and I'll talk in a minute about what that means. This, it is a worse infection, so it's, it's more likely to kill you and put you in the hospital. And there's at least questionable immunity from past infection, but, uh, but some of the vaccines may not be quite as effective, especially the P1 Brazil variant. Uh, it looks like the, even the vaccines will give you at least some immunity, but maybe not complete. And we'll find out as we go, unfortunately. 
Um, so, you know, back like we talked about re very early on in the first series that we talked about uh, Larry Brilliant's TED Talk from way back in 2006, this is not new information. The public health community has known this for generations, that early identification and early response is how you control a pandemic. Vaccines are, the, are often the best uh, part of the response that, f that caps it off, but you still can't drop the early identification, early response side of things. And this is our problem. I think we're hitting what, we're, what I would call a don't test, don't tell attitude. And so a lot of people are not getting tested because if they're positive, it means they can't do what they want to do. And so even in high schools, for example, we did do some voluntary testing a while back, but it was uh, far lower here this past week. Why? Because a lot of high school students learned that if I get a positive test, I might not be able to go to prom or I might not be able to play soccer for 10 days. So I'm just not going to get tested. Uh, and so the problem is we need to get people testing so we can isolate and take people out of infectiousness faster, not do don't test and don't tell. And so we're going to have to fix in the future if this breaks out again. We have to get it right next time. Um, so the infectiousness problem. So again, we've talked about this before, but R0 is the sort of the inherent infectiousness of a virus. Most experts have th thought that that the uh, coronavirus strain was around two and a half to three and a half. And what this does is there's a mathematical formula that will tell you what herd immunity is times the vaccine efficacy, which tell, would tell you what the vaccination rate would need to be to control this virus. So if you had a two and a half to three and a half or not with a 90% vaccine efficacy, you would need somewhere in the range of 67 to 80% of people infected. Unfortunately, if it, this, is vac vir this new variant is 50 to 70% more infectious, we might be talking an R not of 4.5, which means we may need a vaccination rate of 86%. I don't know if we can get there. Also not, it, the, the vaccine efficacy studies are ranging, at least from preventing spread, somewhere in 75 to 90 percent. If it's a 75 percent efficacy, efficacy, you'll notice this is 103 percent, which is not possible, which means you cannot control this virus with vaccines alone if our vaccine efficacy is only 75 percent and our r naughts 4.5. Uh, now, there is a study that just came out about the Pfizer and Moderna, on, in re, and this is real world, not within a study, showing 90% efficacy, which is a good news. So we could be in the 90% phase. Uh, but it was forgotten, you know, it, I don't know, can we get to 86%? If we can't get to 86%, we're still going to have smoldering outfits forever unless we do something else. And the good thing is, is we can do something else. Our not is the inherent infectiousness. We can affect that in the community by doing things like non-pharmaceutical interventions, like having people wear masks, people distancing, test, trace, and isolate. Then we have what's called effective transmission. The effective transmission rate can be much lower. And even with a uh, more infectious strain, we can easily get this under control if we combine vaccination plus uh, these non-pharmaceutical interventions. So we have to quit forgetting. You can't just throw all your masks and say, okay, everybody in the school, it's optional now. That will not work, especially with these variants starting to come through right now. So uh, other things that have come out, the CDC is finally releasing a lot of good studies this uh, past month or so. Uh, one of them, you know, people have, uh, we've known uh, for a long time, and that's why we've been working so hard in Nebraska to get our kids back in schools. And I think that's actually one thing where Nebraska has shown. All of our schools have most of their kids in school and have for quite some time. Here's a study basically confirming the effect on well-being of children that the kids who are doing remote learning just don't do as well. So yes, we definitely need to get these kids back in school because they do better that. Even our Lincoln Public Schools uh, failure rates are, you, we can see a clear a signal that the kids who are doing remote are not doing as well as the kids who are in person. However, of course, that getting kids in person means you also have to effectively control the vac spread within the school and do the right things like masking and distancing and ventilation. So the CDC also has had uh, some good studies coming out uh, talking about this. So you may have seen the, the you know, the, the stuff about three feet versus six feet. Uh, and again, this article uh, from the CDC March 26th, uh, just a few days ago here, uh, going through the Salt Lake City, Utah, showing that essentially as long as mask adherence is high and there's good ventilation, uh, a median of three feet apart is good enough in school to slow down transmission. And so so that's good news. So uh, one of the problems, if you wanted, if you were hardcore about six feet, there's often not enough room to get all the kids back in school. So this confirms you can get all the kids in school uh, with a three foot separation as long as you're masking and doing the other things. Uh, also, this good study about Georgia about how school how uh, outbreaks were spreading within schools, uh, and in these as Georgia school district, they did have uh, nine clusters. Uh, although two of them were related, were actually, were, or half of them were just two clusters. And in those cases, it was educator to educator's transmission, then followed by educator to student. So from a teacher standpoint, it, the risk from getting it from a student is pretty low, except it, unless it's a mask exempt kid. A lot of it actually was going teacher to student direction. Uh, but you know, as long as you do the right things, these can be limited. Uh, they went in, if you go read the study, uh, you'll see that, uh, that uh, 
the many of the the breakdowns were actually uh, inadequate mask use by students when the students did get infected, uh, and then some spread around things like break rooms and things like that. Something that we've we've actually seen. Uh, but essentially, if we do the right things, if we're really good about doing the distancing we need, mask compliance, things like that. That is not optional. This is optimal. If you do that, you can control spread. Of course, unfortunately, there's a bit at big asterisk to these studies. These studies were all done in the setting of not new variants. So this is before the UK variants came in that are now, now that's spreading across the United States, which is more infectious. So these things we learned could end up being less effective, unfortunately, and that's why we have to be so careful right now, because this really could put us back. We are, we still have the possibility, I think, of getting this under control and being close to normal by summer, but we could blow it. And if the way, the way to not blow it is to react quickly, uh, to put the mask mandates back in place before this spreads, to start limiting capacity in, in bars and restaurants as this, if our numbers start rising as soon as possible, not wait three to four weeks to figure this out, uh, because this is going to be a problem. Uh, and again, like I talked about last week, you have to look at layers of protection and not just rely on one thing. Uh, vaccination will give you 75 to 90 percent, but that may not be good enough. Uh, you are probably, I think it's likely we're going to have to at least keep some of these things in place until we can get community translation low enough uh, that we can easily get this under control. And then, then once community control, and we're talking rates not of 15 or 20 per 100,000 like we are right now, we're talking rates of, of 1 to 2 per 100,000. No place in the United States is even close to that yet. And so we need to get our mask uh, ordinance back in place. Uh, and an example I would use just from my own uh, uh, experience this week, I went to pick up my lawnmower Monday, walk into the shop, and the three guys at the shop, all of them at the counter are sitting there, no masks on. Uh, we need to get people to realize, no, this is, we are not done with this yet. Uh, we do need to be careful. Uh, I've been hoping we could keep Nebraska that dress below uh, 3,000. We're around 2,200 right now. Uh, I, my hope, I, well, I guess maybe not hope, but but you know, if we can react fast enough, we can prevent this next surge from being bad enough that we uh, have deaths in the thousands. Probably it'll only be in the hundreds if we can react quickly. Uh, but with these new variants, how infectious they are, the fact they are more serious, we could still be talking about another thousand dead Nebraskans this year. So uh, hopefully react. So again, basic control measures: wear a mask around anyone who doesn't live in your household and has an unknown vaccination status. Uh, you can get together with people who have been vaccinated, and we are. We are going to get together with family this Easter, but all of us except for one have been vaccinated, and she's testing every week at UNL because she's got a UNL access to UNL testing. Uh, avoid the crowded and confined spaces. We'll probably spend most of our time out on the patio because the weather will be beautiful, uh, so we don't have to sit inside the whole time, especially when it's nice. Keep your distance, ideally at least six feet, but three feet may be enough. And then get vaccinated when your number is called. Uh, so hopefully this is helpful to you. Past episodes, again, like I've said, is our unhealthylincoln.org. Usual disclaimer, these are my opinions, not necessarily the organizations I work with and for, but here they are so you know kind of who I am and what I do, uh, and hopefully this helps.